Hi, this is Chad Eby. I'm the Artistic Director of the Jefferson Center Jazz Institute. We're very disappointed that we can't be there with you all this year, um, but we're hoping that these little videos that we're putting together uh, are going to give you something to work on and maybe something to uh, think about over the course of uh, the next few months as you navigate through this new environment we're in right now. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today right now about uh, the three most popular saxophones, not saxophonists, although we'll talk about those as well, but the saxophones uh, that are used most commonly in jazz music. Uh, they also happen to be used most commonly in classical music as well, um, but we're going to focus on the jazz aspect of them today, obviously. Um, so I'm going to start with the one that I have hanging around my neck, which is my primary one, um, which is the tenor saxophone. Uh, the tenor saxophone is typically the most common one found in jazz music. Um, followed closely behind by the alto. Uh, the tenor saxophone has a has a written range that approximates the uh, male human voice but also going up into some you know into the female human voice as well so it tends to be one of those instruments that uh, that we sort of say I can speak my voice through this instrument. Um, so uh, with the tenor saxophone as I said it fits the vocal range of, of most any player who will who will put their voice through the instrument from high notes like that, which would fit into uh, a comfortable woman's voice range. Down into what is, you know, sort of the, the depths of a baritone male speaking voice range. Um, so as a result, the tenor saxophone has a lot of expressive capabilities. It can cover a lot of, it can play a wide variety of melodies in um, ranges that are very pleasing to the human ear. Uh, it tends not to interfere with the timbre of, in particular, bass notes. Um, uh, so if your bass player is playing, you know, you're rarely going to reach their range and sort of muddy up the waters with your sound. Um, it's capable of playing wide leaps in melody, which are of course very, very dramatic um, and can be very uh, exciting and rich sounding. Um, for example, this is a song by Duke Ellington uh, entitled uh, Prelude to a Kiss, but I'm gonna jump straight to the bridge. <laughs> So those wide leaps, you know, the melody that I just played stretched from here to here. A broad range of sounds that are available to you and it can be extremely expressive and rich and warm. Um, so the tenor saxophone, the primary uh, jazz performers on that instrument, there have been so many, but if you've sort of had to whittle it down to the shortest possible list. Most of you will have probably heard of John Coltrane. It would be important for you to check him out if you haven't listened to his music. It can be a little bit shocking sometimes to listen to his music depending on where you start. So ask somebody what's a good place with Coltrane's music to start. I would say start with something like uh, his album Ballads, um, which was released in the early 1960s on the Impulse label. Perhaps uh, the album he did in duo with Duke Ellington uh, and work out from there. Um, in other important voices on the tenor saxophone, probably the most important one was the f was one of the first ones, Lester Young, who was in the Count Basie Orchestra back in the 1930s through the early 1940s. Um, and then there have been hundreds of other great tenor saxophone players along the way. Recent recent people uh, who have been played who have played the tenor saxophone and really um, established themselves as the primary voices are people like Michael Brecker. Um, also, uh, a great tenor saxophonist who was just at the Jazz Institute, or not at the Jazz Institute, but the Jefferson Center a couple of years ago, J.D. Allen, also a really incredible voice on the tenor saxophone. And then also someone else who was at the Jefferson Center not too long ago was a great tenor saxophonist, young player by the name of Melissa Aldana. So that's the tenor saxophone. It's my favorite. Sorry. I'm not sorry, actually. But continuing on, let's talk about the alto saxophone. So... The alto saxophone is probably the one that you started on when you were in 
middle school uh, or even in high school if you started there. Um, it tends to be the one that uh, fits people's bodies the best. Um, there have been fewer uh, alto saxophone players, but but not a small number uh, in, in jazz. Um, certainly not as many as there were tenor players, but the two primary most important ones in, if, if you had to narrow it down, in the early days of jazz were Johnny Hodges, who was the lead alto player in the Duke Ellington Orchestra, and also Charlie Parker, who was, uh, who was uh, active from about early 1940 until 1955. Uh, the alto saxophone is a slightly higher range than the tenor saxophone. Um, it, 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 because it doesn't have quite as much as the low range, it, it has a little bit less color to work with. It, of course, has higher notes available to you, but higher is not necessarily always better, so it just depends on the circumstances whether or not those sounds are good. So here's the highest possible note on the alto saxophone. And we can walk all the way down to the bottom of the instrument. My reed dried out while I was playing tenor. So that's the alto saxophone. Uh, as I mentioned, Johnny Hodges, Charlie Parker, really important in the development of alto saxophone in the history of jazz. Um, some more recent players uh, who have been on the scene, who have been making a big splash. Uh, there's a fantastic young player named Alexa Tarantino who's on the scene. Uh, another young player named Terrace Martin who has been doing some producing for hip hop music as well as uh, being a member of Herbie Hancock's band. Um, Ted Nash is another great voice on the alto saxophone. So that's the alto, probably the one you have in your closet if you haven't been, if, you, if you're an amateur, maybe you have a tenor, but the alto is likely the one that you have sitting around. So let's move on to, while not the last saxophone in the universe and not nor the least, uh, this is maybe the one that gets played uh, significantly less often, but has also been very important in the development of jazz. So this is the soprano saxophone. It looks, of course, shaped sort of like a clarinet or an oboe, um, but it is definitely a saxophone, and it has a higher range yet again than the alto saxophone. This is an octave above the tenor. Um, and so this is a very high-pitched instrument, and as a result, it maybe has a little bit less opportunity for use. Soprano saxophone was really important in, in early jazz um, in the hands of a man by the name of Sidney Bechet, who was from New Orleans. Um, and then it sort of disappeared for a while and then came rushing back in the 1950s and 60s and now pretty much every saxophone player owes, owns one of these and plays it sort of on the side as their secondary instrument. Um, after um, Sidney Bechet, who was known for playing, uh, as I said, New Orleans based music with really uh, rich vibrato and uh, all kinds of outgoing inflections, Lots of, the soprano saxophone reacts so much to you when you play it that it's easy to play these sort of big, grand gestures. Uh, and as I said, it was really important in early jazz. Um, after Sidney Bechet, there were a handful of people who were important moving through the 20th century. Steve Lacey was a very important uh, soprano saxophonist from the 1950s until his death in about 2000. Um, Wayne Shorter, uh, who is still with us in his 80s now, um, still at the forefront of modern music. Um, another great voice on the soprano saxophone is Branford Marcellus um, of the Marcellus family from New Orleans. Um, and as well, another uh, really key voice on the soprano saxophone specifically is Jane Ira Bloom. So I hope that uh, if you didn't, weren't, if you weren't aware of some of these instruments or just were not aware of some of the players you should be checking out, I hope you'd be willing to take some time to do that, uh, especially with the extra time you probably have on your hands right now. Um, so feel free to contact me through the Jefferson Center if you have any questions about specific album requests or, or suggestions from me, and I'd be glad to send them your way. All right, thanks.